Hi, my name is Michael Root. I'm a second year internal medicine resident at UCSF, and I'll be talking to you today about oxygenation and oxygen delivery devices. Disclaimer is that this is for medical education purposes only. The objectives here are to describe the two most common ways we measure oxygenation, to describe the differences between PaO2 and SpO2, and to compare and contrast different oxygen delivery modalities uh, to treat your patients with hypoxemia. First is measuring oxygenation. The most common way we do this is through pulse oximetry, which uses color wave spectrophotometry, emits two wavelengths, one for oxygenated, one for deoxygenated hemoglobin, and the sensor detects the absorbance. The outputs are SpO2, which is as a percentage of the oxygenated hemoglobin, and a waveform. Waveforms here, the top one shows a dichrotic notch, which is an adequate perfusion, adequate signal. And the bottom one is low perfusion, which often indicates that the probe needs to be replaced or repositioned. The advantages are that it's rapid and accurate, although the accuracy decreases as SpO2 drops. It's not invasive and it's continuous to enable trends. The disadvantages are that it cannot detect hyperoxemia. There's no data on ventilation, so no CO2 information. It depends on distal perfusion and states like hypotension and hypothermia uh, affect this. Arterial blood gas is used uh, by directly sampling the arterial blood. There are technical aspects involved to make sure it's accurate. And this measures the partial pressure of dissolved O2 in arterial blood. And it gives you other outputs that we'll discuss in a second. The advantages are that it obtains more information for the acid base status as well as ventilation with CO2. And it aids in your clinical decision making tools, such as calculating AA gradients and PDF ratios and ARDS. Disadvantages are that it's invasive, more expensive, there's one time point, so often needs more than one AVG, and there are rare but possible complications. Next, we'll talk about our oxygen delivery devices. When approaching a patient with hypoxemia and which device to use, things to consider are, what is the clinical status of my patient? Are they rapidly decompensating in front of me? Are they confused, combative, or delirious? What is the degree of hypoxemia, and what is my goal oxygenation for this patient, which often changes in uh, chronic lung diseases? What is my desired FO2 and flow rate? So what are my options? There are many options to choose from, and again, respiratory therapists will be your best friends here, and we'll break these down into variable performance and fixed performance devices, and then finally talk about um, CPAP and bi-level lastly. Variable performance means that FO2 delivered is dependent on the patient's peak inspiratory flow rate, and fixed performance means that I can deliver an FO2 regardless of my patient's flow. Nasal cannula is often the most commonly used device and most clinicians have familiarity with it. It's simple tubing with nasal prongs and delivers flow between one and six liters per minute. The FO2 varies between 25 and 40%. And the tip to remember here is that every one liter per minute extra gives you about 4% extra FO2. The advantages are that it's lightweight, inexpensive, and mobile. However, the downsides are there's variable FO2 with room air mixing as patients often mouth breeze mouth breathe or have variable respiratory rate and tidal volume. Next is high flow nasal cannula. One device is shown here. It's a freestanding device that mixes 100% oxygen with room air. It's heated and humidified to enable delivery of high flows and it's delivered through a little more sturdy nasal prong than compared to your, your basic nasal cannula. Flows are up to 60 liters per minute and FiO2 is up to 100%. The caveat here is that this is a, again a variable performance device. Um, and there are institution-specific titration schedules where respiratory therapists sometimes um, have a limit on the flow they can use, um, as well as whether they titrate the flow or FiO2 first. And so this is a discussion with them. The advantages are there's close FiO2 titration. It does wash out dead space and helps with ventilation, decreases work of breathing and respiratory rate, and there is some PEEP with higher flows that can augment your oxygenation. The disadvantages for high flow nasal cannula, that's high oxygenation use, it's less mobile, and it's higher tech, and so you're often working very closely with respiratory therapy for this. A simple face mask, shown here, is over the nose and mouth, common in pre and post-op settings, and there's flow between six and 10 liters. Uh, the, generally, the higher flows are to avoid rebreathing within the mask itself. FiO2 ranges between 35 and 50%. The advantages are that it's easy to apply and available in most settings, and it can generate high FiO2. However, the downsides are that in delirious and anxious patients, they often are not well tolerated, and it's not precise delivery of oxygen, as we discussed previously.
Lastly, risk of aspiration in patients um, if they are vomiting or nauseous. Venturi mask is next and shown here. This is a fixed device, which is a face mask with uh, different adapters to enable a fixed FiO2 in liters per minute flow. Uh, these holes need to maintain a patency and RT can help you with this. It delivers an exact FiO2 between 24 and 50%. The advantages are that it's constant and precise and the disadvantages are that it requires port exchanges and the same downsides as a simple mask with anxious patients and aspiration risk patients. A non-rebreather, shown here, is a face mask in a reservoir bag. There's a one-way valve to prevent rebreathing through the reservoir bag. And then indications here is, is often rescue um, hypoxemia and high FiO2 needs. The flows are generally between 10 and 15 liters per minute, and the high flows are needed to, to maintain patency of the bag and make sure that's inflated at all times. FiO2 ranges between 80 and 95%, and so we see it's a fa fairly high FiO2 delivery. The advantages I mentioned are reliably high FiO2, you can add a nasal cannula underneath the mask for an extra FiO2 bump. However, the downsides are that it's not perfect. It's not a perfect 100%, but pretty close. It's an imperfect fit with any mask, um, so allows room air entrainment. And if prolonged use, it's generally a rescue therapy, and so we think about non-invasive ventilation in these situations. Lastly, and this is often an ICU topic, but we'll talk very briefly about non-invasive ventilation. This is a positive pressure ventilation through a non-invasive face mask. There are variable modes, but the two most common that you'll encounter are CPAP, which is primarily an oxygenation modality, and bilevel, which is an oxygenation and ventilation modality. Common indications for non-invasive ventilation include COPD exacerbation with hypercapnia, cardiogenic pulmonary edema, and post-extubation assist to prevent reintubation. The advantages are that there, in addition to oxygenation, you can include some modes with ventilation assist. There's high FiO2 delivery and can prevent intubation or reintubation in many critically ill patients. The downsides for non-invasive are that there are contraindications to using this device. The uncooperative patient or ones where they cannot handle their secretions or high aspiration risks um, should not use non-invasive ventilation. And lastly, there's variable toleration of masks. And luckily with your respiratory therapist, there are nasal prongs, nasal pillows, and other devices to use to help a patient tolerate this better, um, but sometimes they simply cannot. And lastly, in summary, um, presented a lot of information here, but this is a table to reference um, for the common devices we discussed, the variable FiO2 in liters per minute, and some common advantages and disadvantages to reference in the future. Thank you for listening, um, and thank you to all the providers and staff at the hospitals around the country, especially in New York, um, that are handling this pandemic. Um, as an NYU alumni myself, um, I wish I was there. And so thank you uh, from all of us.